The opinions expressed on this site and by Dr. Jen the Vet are published for education and informational purposes only and are not intended as a diagnosis, treatment, or as a substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment. Welcome to another episode of Is This a Thing? Veterinary Translations for Pet Owners. I'm your host, Dr. Jen the Vet. And if you're a pet owner who's interested in learning more about vet med in order to better care for your pet, or just communicate with their vet, then please click subscribe and never miss an episode. Today, we're gonna to talk about one of my favorite topics. You all know I love infectious diseases, but I particularly like leptospirosis. Some of you may have heard of it. People call it lepto. It's a really interesting uh, pathogen. So let's get right to it. Leptospirosis is actually not new. It's been around and identified since the 1800s, if not sooner. And it has a lot of different names. Um, it used to be associated with the harvest. And in fact, it was called the wheelbarrow disease in old uh, German medical textbooks for people. Because lepto is a zoonotic disease, which means that not only can your dog get it, but so can you. It was called the wheelbarrow disease because the most common presenting symptom at that time was that during the harvest, the farmer would be out harvesting and he would become so ill that he would have to be carried back to the farmhouse in, you guessed it, a wheelbarrow. And so it was called the wheelbarrow disease. It was also called um, uh, autumn jaundice or harvest jaundice because it can affect the liver as well as the kidneys. You might know whenever your liver is diseased significantly, your skin and your eyes and stuff kind of get a yellow hue to them called jaundice. It is a bacteria and it lives well in warm, slow moving water, but it doesn't have to have just those specific conditions. And in fact, Lepto is considered ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Even if you live in the deserts of Arizona, leptospirosis is a threat for your dog. In fact, there's been a number of outbreaks there. Even if you don't live in the country, leptospirosis is a threat for your dog. So how is it getting everywhere? Well, there are different serivars or strains of lepto and each of them has adapted or evolved to maintain themselves in a specific host species. So for instance, there is a type of lepto called ecterohemorrhagiae. That's the only time I'm gonna say it because we just call it ictero. And the maintenance host for that is rats, rodents. And what that means is that those rodents can become infected with the bacteria and they can shed it in their urine and they're not really sick. But if they become infected with another serivar or type or strain of lepto, then they can become sick. They're considered the maintenance host for ictero. Canicola is the serivar that dogs can be a maintenance host for. So there's all different, there's 250 different types of lepto. Not all of them cause disease in every creature. Right now in the United States, there are four serivars that we know to cause disease in dogs. So I've told you it's a bacteria. I've told you that you get it from, well, I didn't tell you, you get it from ingesting or eating contaminated water or food. If there's dirt on something. It's another reason to wash your vegetables, but your dogs get it because dogs never pass on a puddle. I've never seen a dog that passed up a puddle. If there has been a raccoon, a possum, a feral hog, another dog, gosh, almost anything that went through there and could have urinated in it or had urine contaminated hands or feet, then they've contaminated that puddle and then your dog lays in it, laps it up, gets it all over them, they're panting and it gets in their mouth, and now they have potentially have lepto. There's lots of different ways that lepto can show up. So let's talk about clinical signs in dogs. Clinical signs in dogs for lepto are pretty varied. It can present like a urinary tract infection. The dog could just be having accidents in the house very frequently. They could be drinking a lot of extra water. They could be vomiting. They could also have diarrhea. 
They can actually have conjunctivitis or inflammation in their eyes. I don't think that's super common. They may or may not have a fever. They may be anorexic or off their food, not really wanting to eat. Maybe they eat some candy, some treats, but they won't eat their regular food. Also, if you pick up your dog's lip and you look at their gums and their gums are yellow, you need to take them to the vet immediately. That can be from a number of different things, but lepto certainly should be on the list. Then you get to the vet. Are there, te can we test for it? Yeah, so let's talk about what your vet's gonna do. What are some diagnostics? Diagnostics for lepto could be blood test, could be urine test, it could be something that they have to send out, or it could be something they do right there. It depends. There's a couple different ways. We look for antibody titers to lepto. Now, if your pet has been vaccinated in the past for lepto, you need to let the veterinarian know that because they may be positive on some lepto testing if they've been vaccinated. They, we, they also, we can look for the lepto bacteria itself. That's pretty tricky to find though, and so we don't always look for it. There's another way that we can look, which is PCR, polymerase chain reaction, where we usually look in urine for that, and we're looking for the, any little bit of genetic material from the bacteria itself in the urine, because lepto likes to set up shop in the kidneys and be excreted through the urine. That's how we test for it. But now, how are we gonna treat it? So let's talk about some things that your vet might use to treat your pet for lepto. Treatment for lepto is largely dependent on kind of the presenting clinical signs. So depending on how severe the illness is, if it's just a simple urinary tract infection that's caused by lepto, then your pet might get some subcutaneous fluids right then at the vet um, and be sent home on some antibiotics. It is important that you always finish the entire prescription of antibiotics. Most likely, your vet's going to want to test your dog again near the end of the antibiotics to make sure that it's okay to, to stop when you finish that prescription or to determine if we need to extend it. So it's important to finish it. That's if it's just a simple urinary tract infection. If your dog is more severe, severely ill, if they're not eating, if they're vomiting, then they may need to be hospitalized. If your vet runs blood work, which they likely are going to do, if your dog is vomiting, has diarrhea, isn't eating, and the kidney values are elevated, the BUN and creatinine, then they may recommend hospitalizing your pet for IV fluids. This is critical. This is probably the most critical piece of therapy for a dog in that situation. They're gonna put them on IV fluids and they're gonna start them on IV antibiotics. And then they're gonna retest their kidney values probably in 24 or 48 hours to make sure they're responding. The same goes true if the liver enzymes are elevated or if your dog is jaundiced, they're yellow, their gums are yellow or their eyes are yellow when you present them, they're going to wanna to be aggressive then as well. If the liver is involved, the hepatic form of leptospirosis is very, very severe and very deadly to dogs. You can easily avoid all of this trouble if you get your dog vaccinated. So let's talk about preventing lepto. There's a vaccine for lepto. You don't have to worry about every puddle your dog steps in. All you have to do is get your dog vaccinated once a year for leptospirosis. On the internet, there's a lot of stuff that's said about lepto because it's true, you know, 20, 30 years ago when they first started producing lepto vaccines, there were lots of adverse reactions. And by that, I mean dogs with swollen faces, um, vomiting and diarrhea, etc. And so people didn't vaccinate very well for lepto because the owners didn't want to because they were afraid. The veterinarians didn't want to because they were afraid. It seemed like only big breed dogs that lived in rural areas were the ones that were vaccinated for lepto because they had a higher likelihood or a higher risk of illness from lepto. But now that has shifted. Now we know that it's actually little dogs that are less than 15 pounds and live in urban areas are more likely to be exposed 
telepto. And that's because of the ictero cerevar from the rodents and the rats um, and some others, but really it's because of the rodent population that exists in some really intense urban areas, but also the rise of the urban raccoon. Raccoons are frequently implicated in lepto outbreaks. You want to make sure that you get your pet vaccinated. These days, lepto vaccines are very, very different. They're much safer. They're galaxies better than the ones that first hit the market 20 or 30 years ago. It is well worth it to vaccinate your dog. Every dog, Every dog is at risk for infection with lepto. I would wager every dog ought to be vaccinated for lepto. If you're afraid of the reaction rate, talk to your veterinarian. Tell them that you're concerned about that. There are things that we can do as veterinarians to mitigate or decrease the risk of an adverse reaction. The other thing is that these days, like I said, those vaccines are so much better. There's one lepto vaccine on the market that vaccinates for four cerevars, which is the most you can have these days. And the adverse reaction rate to that vaccine is the same as it is for a distemper vaccination. And there's no one that's afraid of vaccinating for distemper because of adverse reactions, because that's really rare. So there's no reason you shouldn't talk to your vet and let them know that you're concerned about lepto, but you're also concerned about reactions and work through it. Because what you don't want to do is end up with a dog that needs dialysis because their kidneys are so severely impacted by a lepto infection because that's very expensive and it doesn't always work. So get your dog vaccinated. Lepto is zoonotic, so how are we going to keep from getting it? Let's talk about the zoonotic risk. Again, let's just revisit how does one become infected with lepto? Well, the same way that your dog does, by taking something disgusting and putting it in your mouth. And by that I mean, if you come into contact with an animal with lepto, don't drink their urine, right? It's, this is not rocket science. Don't get in nasty water. If you have cuts and scrapes, don't put those in dirty water that might be contaminated with lepto. Just don't do it. The other thing is you want to, if you have a pet that's diagnosed with lepto, you want to be very careful, especially with small children, only because I don't think they're going to drink dog urine. Of course I don't. But have you ever seen how a kid pets a dog with their mouth open, right? So you want to make sure that everyone in the house washes their hands frequently at that point in time and is very careful about what they do with the dog. The good news is that if your dog has lepto, we're fairly certain that after 48 hours of antibiotics, they're no longer shedding the lepto in their urine. However, you still should avoid drinking dog urine. Leptospirosis is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. Every dog is likely at risk. Talk to your veterinarian about what the common clinical signs might be and get your dog vaccinated. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode. I'm Dr. Jen Levet, and this has been Is This a Thing? Veterinary Translations for Pet Owners. If you're a pet owner interested in learning more about vet med in order to better care for your pet or communicate with their vet, then please click subscribe and you'll never miss an episode. Please remember, no YouTube video is a substitute for a visit to the vet. I'll see you all in the next episode. The opinions expressed on the site and by Dr. Jen the Vet are published for education and informational purposes only and are not intended as a diagnosis, treatment, or as a substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment.